I think the interesting thing about the evolution of security probably in the last 15 or 20 years, not to date myself too much, is, is it went from something that was understood to be important. It evolved into something that's table stakes. And I think the next evolution and the evolution that Sumo Logic has been on for quite some time and including my tenure is that table stakes aren't enough, right? How do we, ta table stakes means you get to be at the table. It doesn't mean that you get to win. Um, and how do we leverage security programs to help our organizations win? Hi, this is your Swapnil Bhartia and welcome to TFR. Let's talk. Today we have with us John Wisniewski, CISO at Sumo Logic. John, it's great to have you on the show. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. It's my pleasure. And today we are going to talk about how DevOps team can position themselves as mission critical to their whole organization. But before we deep dive into this topic, let's quickly remind our viewers what is Sumo Logic all about. Yeah, Sumo Logic is a, is a cloud native uh, log analysis monitoring company um, that also is one of the leaders in the in the sim space. So we play both on the observability and monitoring side of the house and the security uh, observability incident response side of the house. Now, when we look at the whole security, it has changed a lot since the whole emergence of cloud, cloud native, especially earlier used to be an afterthought. Now security, you know, your CISO, it's becoming a board label discussion. It is moving in developer's pipeline. It is becoming a priority. It's no longer an afterthought. But when we look at the whole cloud native landscape, as you also mentioned, you know, there are different, we can talk about, you know, practices, technologies, we talk about observability, you know, the whole, you know, and things sometimes overlap and sometimes there are gap. I talk to folks, are you in the observability space or security space? They're like, you know, we just like play, but you know, so it's a bit of, uh, I mean, Kubernetes itself is quite complicated now. So I would like to uh, to like, you know, just kind of zoom out. And if I ask you, how do you look at security, cyber security in modern world? Of course, everybody wants security, but the thing is, what do they do to achieve that security? That becomes critical. So let's talk about how do you see security has evolved. Also look at how the market, the use case has evolved because like, like companies, you know, they are doing a lot of things, you know, they're dealing with a lot of sensitive data, so security is really important, but how it has evolved. And then of course, uh, a good segue will be how companies like Sumo Logic has, have evolved to cater to these changing needs. I think the interesting thing about the evolution of security probably in the last 15 or 20 years, not to date myself too much, is, is it went from something that was understood to be important, it evolved into something that's table stakes, and I think the next evolution and the evolution that Sumo Logic has been on for quite some time and including my tenure is that table stakes aren't enough, right? How do we, ta table stakes means you get to be at the table. It doesn't mean that you get to win. Um, and how do we leverage security programs to help our organizations win? And that's by, you know, figuring out what the business objectives are and not just pretending to align to those business objectives, but really thinking through your KPIs and your day-to-day -day workloads um, that are helping the company be successful be it a manufacturing company or a web services company and things like that. And so at Sumo Logic, we take it to heart that we, we take those business objectives and we move backwards um, from those objectives to develop our KPIs, develop, you know, how we're going to budget for the next, the, the next year, how we're going to resource, how we're going to advocate to the board um, why security is not just a barrier uh, or, or, or an entry point or a cost center, um, but how we can really help enable the business be successful. Now, when we look at security, Sometimes security is not seen as uh, something which drives revenue, something that drives business. It's more or less like you know having a you know airbag or brakes in your car, but that doesn't put a V8 engine or V12 or V16, depending on how you look at it. Uh, can you talk about the business success side of security and uh, how? Teams, you know, once again, we can look at it, whether they are still soft silos, whether we are looking at the whole DevOps, DevSecOps, you know, kind of, you know, principle you're talking about. Uh, so look at, you know, the investment in security also reflect on business success. Yeah, I'll, I'll use your car analogy, right? Uh, the American, uh, you know, auto manufacturing organizations, they can't put out a vehicle these days without airbags or without a seatbelt. But that doesn't mean that the airbag manufacturers and the seatbelt manufacturers shouldn't be doing everything they can to optimize their products in order for that car to sell better. It's the same thing for cybersecurity right now, in my opinion, that we need to be understanding that while we do have all these compliance requirements, while we do want to be protecting the organization, 
It's our job to optimize those programs to make sure that we're not slowing the business so far down that they can't actually achieve what they're doing. So as an example, at Sumo Logic, one of the things that we're doing is measuring things like vulnerability management, not just how quickly can we close those vulnerabilities. That's awesome. But really taking that next step and saying, how do we tailor that program, use the right technologies, people, and processes to make sure that the engineer engineering burden for that vulnerability management program shrinks over time? And when that burden shrinks over time, when you take their cycles from you know 10% a week to 5% a week, that means that extra 5%, they can recommit to doing what they're supposed to be doing, which is driving the business forward through engineering products and new product improvements and things like that, which is sort of essential for the DevOps side of the house as well, right? It's not just about how fast you commit code. It's about continuous improvement. And so the security team's job um, is to ensure that that continuous improvement is focused on giving cycles back to each part of the business, whether it's your engineering team, your product team, your IT team, or your finance team. It's not enough just to protect the enterprise. You have to protect it in such a way that you're constantly helping them do their job better, faster, and smarter. Now, can you also talk about the role of uh, DevOps champions and how they can help uh, DevOps team to kind of show that they are mission critical as well? When you, when, when you start from sort of where we're at now, which is um, we like to throw the term DevSecOps around, right? And I love the term. But it also kind of feels like security kind of just inserted themselves into the DevOps paradigm. And really in practice, it shouldn't just be we have meetings. It should really be about having an understanding that on the observability, performance, reliability side of the house and on the security side of the house, the information that we draw in through whether it's the same platform like Sumo Logic or whether it's desperate platforms, we have to have an understanding that, that those data sets and the more those teams are singing off the same sheet of music is going to help them both be successful. As an example, in my experience, some of the gnarliest security incidents we've had to deal with, we didn't necessarily discover through pure security tooling. In some cases, we discovered it because the DevOps team had set up dashboards and monitoring and alerting on their side in such a way that when they saw a large anomaly, they, they pull us in to say, hey, can you take a look as well? And then that feeds us in terms of our ability to respond. And it works the other way around too. Sometimes we find something in the sim where it's like, this doesn't seem to be firing right and we're concerned um, that it's an incident. But really it might just mean that something in the DevOps infrastructure, the CI CD pipeline uh, isn't working correctly. And so that's what we all need to be marching towards is this idea that um, we're not, we're not, we shouldn't be siloed. Um, because that just limits our ability to respond to either operational imperatives or security imperatives. And can you also talk about how, what kind of collaboration do you see within teams? We do love to talk about you know all these collaborations, but realistically, how much team collaborate or they still work in silos? Uh, do developers are still scared of security teams? I'm just trying to understand the cultural aspect within team to become more efficient. Yeah, I mean, I think you're talking about the holy grail. Right. And, and that's what we're all driving towards, you know, every single day in terms of improving that um, that relationship. It's no secret that developer product engineering teams and security teams just have friction. In my personal opinion, it should be incumbent upon the security team to be the first one that reaches across the proverbial aisle to say, hey, you know, we're just trying to help you get those cycles back. We understand we're going to send you a ton of alerts. We understand we have to do AppSec reviews. We understand you know, that you have a, a mission to, to, to build and continuously improve, you know, modern applications in the cloud. And we want to be, make sure that we're partnering in a way that helps you do your job faster. Um, and I know that sounds like a whole lot of lip service, but then ha you have to follow through with, with those metrics and those KPIs that say, hey, I'm not, I, you know, I'm not just telling you I want to work with you. I'm holding myself accountable to the board and to our company leadership that the metrics I'm presenting aren't just things that are like mean time to triage and mean time to remediate, but taking that next step and saying, how are we measuring our impact on engineering and DevOps teams? And I think that goes a long way towards earning the trust that you need from the developers. And then that trust starts to, that, that trust starts to make sure that you have that two way information flow. So again, when a developer sees that an app is, acting strange or acting awry, they're not afraid to tell the security team that that might be something that's happening. Quite the contrary, they see us as problem solvers first and security practitioners second. And if you can get there, you end up having that true interlocked um, collaboration 
as opposed to just having a, a monthly meeting where you go over your roadmap. How can DevOps team show their alignment with their company's business objectives? I think there's two ways. Um, the first way, again, going back to your metrics and your KPIs, your typical DevOps shop is going to have metrics and KPIs that matter to them. And the engineers on the team might have a fundamental understanding of how that matters to the business. But commonly between those two organizations, your DevOps shop and the business, it gets sort of lost in translation um, because we can't expect, you, you know, your average CFO or your average, you know, general counsel, or your average CEO or whatever it is to have an understanding of like the technical depth um, is required for DevOps teams. And so, again, going to the business objectives and then taking a look at your own internal KPIs and figuring out how you can make that translation a little bit more seamless in terms of helping the business understand that why that continuous improvement, why code check-ins and secure code check-ins are important. Um, that goes a long way. And that doesn't work unless you have the second thing, uh, which, is, which is a champion, right? Uh, we can't expect every engineer in the world, including security engineers, we can't expect every engineer in the world to be able to speak business. Um, but we do need to embed those people within the organization, whether you find an engineer that's particularly eloquent or is able to make that translation from deep into the weeds into business speak and find those folks that are good at crafting that particular story and lean on them to be the advocates for your DevOps team within the board or within your, 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 um, your organizational leadership. How do you folks look at some of the emerging, you know, technologies we can look at Gen AI, AI has been around for a very long time, Gen AI, and there are a lot of emerging use cases also. So every time you either bring a new technology or you look at a new use case, you also look at the security implications as well. So you want to allow your teams to dip their toes in newer technologies. At the same time, you want things to be stable and secure. So how do you suggest maintaining a balance between the new stuff, shiny object, and the well-trusted, even rusty stuff? Well, I think when it comes to Gen AI specifically, um, we need to have an understanding that it's, 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 to your point, it's no longer really emergent. Now it's, you know, the horse is out of the barn and it's four farms over. Now we actually need to start playing catch up um, to ensure that we are doing sort of three, three things. Thing one is securing our AI platforms. So that is something that we've been doing with vendors for a very long time, right? Uh, reviews of the technology, deep dives into how it works and the secret sauce that's underneath to make sure it's really AI. All those sorts of things that we've sort of, we've sort of been doing for supply chain security for a long time. The second bucket is using AI for security purposes, right? Like the whole point of generative AI is to make people do things faster, stronger, more effectively, you know, <clears throat> you name it. And so having an understanding of how security teams can leverage those tools to protect themselves. And then the third bucket, which is I think the, the gnarly scary one right now, is having an understanding of how AI is going to present threats to your organization. But if you have those three things in order and have an understanding of how your organization wants to, to, to do it, it's just a matter of putting the right guardrails in place, which is very similar to what we've been doing for years and years and years. I was at an event very recently where someone said something pretty, I felt like it was profound, which is just because Gen AI is here, let's not forget the last 40 years of learned experience within security. Because actually, if you abstract the technology itself, it's just like any emergent technology that we've had in the past. The conversations we're having about Gen AI are very similar to the conversations that were happening when people were shifting into cloud workloads. I'm not sure if it's secure enough. I'm not sure if I have enough control over my data. Like those questions are popping back up. And so instead of, instead of like the security organization taking a step back and like being super cautious and risk averse, quite the contrary, I think we're going to be able to get ahead of those risks if we lean all the way forward and take a, a leadership um, position within the organization in terms of how we want to use AI, how we want to protect AI, and most importantly, educating the organization on, on the possible risks and benefits of, of the technology. And that will be the same for the next shiny object, right? And that should be the same for the shiny object after that, is, is the years of learned experience that we have, just applying them to something that might look a little bit different. John, thank you so much for joining me today. And of course, talk about cybersecurity, the cultural aspect of it. Thanks for great insights. I'd love to have you folks back on the show. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me and uh, look forward to talking to you again.